All right, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 3 again. Revelation chapter 3 again. Now remember, we're on the timeline of either at the end of Sardis or the beginning of Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia. We are either nearing the end of Sardis or the beginning of Philadelphia. And there are some passages that matches with the church of Sardis and with the church of Philadelphia. Again, the church of Philadelphia, that is basically uh, the church that is on fire and no man can shut the door. If you look at Revelation chapter 3 in verse 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. If you recall... Uh, Martin Luther was the one that uh, broke the Roman Empire through the Reformation. With that Reformation, now no one can shut the door. I mean, he opened up Pandora's box. And the Bible believers were able to have some sort of freedom to spread it around. This can also match with the Church of Sardis, because you might recall the Church of Sardis is a cold church. It is a dead church. And during this timeline, it is accurate to say that the Roman Catholic era is a very dead era. And the Reformation, sure, it opened the door and it started the fire, but it can also be used as the opposite. It was also a very cold timeline because the Protestants, they were able to convert empires to their own beliefs, and Rome was losing its own empires. But remember, church states are never a sign of revival. It's a spiritual, inner uh, revival thing. It's not church state. So if you look at the history of Luther and then the Calvinists who were able to take over the empires and the Protestants, it was pretty much dead. They weren't very evangelistic, so to speak. They weren't soul winners. Instead, there was political warfare, fighting for whatever territory that they can have their own church within that state. So whichever church took over whichever state, that was the fight. And that's not really a sign of revival. So you can take that as either or. However, there's a few that uh, have kept the fire going in Sardis, and they're not completely dead. So that's why in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 4, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So because the church of Sardis, even though it's a dead era, there's a few names, a few names that can keep it going, which is why God sees them as worthy. So names you can see right here. We see Erasmus, we see Martin Luther, and then we're going to look at a lot of other names when we keep going down this list. So either the end of Sardis, we call it, or the beginning of Philadelphia. Now remember that the devil, he always sends a serpent whenever there's a sign of revival. Let me repeat that again. The devil always sends a serpent whenever there's a sign of revival. And what he will do, and we study this in history, he will take the things of God and morph into it like a chameleon so that he can make it dead. We see that pagan Rome was falling apart and Christianity was on fire. So the devil, he, like a chameleon, converted pagan Rome into Roman Catholic. And so if you've seen nearly a millennia of your history of Catholic religious or pagan Rome. And that is considered dead. That's not considered a sign of revival. So then Reformation came in, broke the Roman Empire apart. And remember, our Baptist forefathers, I say Baptist quote-unquote, the name wasn't there, but basically the Bible believers who kept the Baptist distinctives or the Bible-believing distinctives, which I taught you in our intermediate discipleship class long ago, who, whatever group kept those distinctives kept on going. Luther opened the door so then they were able to spread out even further. That's what happened. So they were always there, but the Reformation was that big open door where they got the more attention, 
or they were able to freely spread out further. But then the devil, like a chameleon again, like a chameleon, he converts whatever is in here, and then we get John Calvin. So John Calvin, he distorts the Bible-believing line. So then we see this line right here where it's pretty abstract. It's not really a straight line. It's not really a Bible-believing line. So I would say this is another line from Roman Empire, then Reformation, and then Calvinism came out. So we see people who were following the Reformation but uh, entertain ideas of Calvinism. We see that Eurig Zwingli was church state, and we've seen that John Calvin was church state. And John Calvin was the one who revived Augustine's religious cultic belief called Calvinism, just like the religious cultic belief of Catholicism. And I don't care what Rav Ravi Zacharias says about, be careful with the word cult. He's found it as a pervert anyway. So uh, who would listen to a word of a pervert? Oh, Calvinists would. Non-denominationals would, because he talks very smooth. Just like you suckers watching online, whenever a Calvinist preacher just talks very smooth, you just listen to him. Yeah. Instead of looking at... Uh, the person's flowery, lang flowery language, why don't you look at the Word of God? All right, I know my language is not smooth and I apologize, but I deliberately keep it that way so that I can keep people's eyes open so that you can't just follow people's speech that flows like milk and butter. You have to go by the Word of God. And that's my direct attention that I'm going to give to you all the stinking time, okay? So we have to keep it that way. Uh, let's see right here. Now, with Calvinism, that just corrupted everything nowadays. Uh, with their infamous tulip, I've pointed out what that was. That's their uh, five damnable beliefs in Calvinism. Now, there are some parts that uh, we can agree with. That's why sometimes Bible believers are called moderate Calvinists, because there are, there are some moderate levels. We can agree with this. Like, for example, total depravity. We can agree that man is totally depraved. But we disagree with, in, uh, with the Calvinist about total inability. In other words, a man, he is unable, because he is totally depraved, he is unable to do anything good or to uh, be receptive to the gospel or receive Christ for salvation. So that's an example. I've already explained that last time. Now, as the Bible believers are coming out, it's always a second generation or somebody who takes the Bible believers mantle and then it goes downhill. Luther was the guy. He's the one that kicked people's tail and he was a rough guy. Melanchthon, who came after him, was the guy who talked like Ravi Zacharias. He was the theologian. He's the guy that talked like uh, milk and butter. If you looked at uh, the history of the New Testament church from Dr. Ruckman, page 473, I will go over here. So this is what happened to the Bible-believing line. You'll notice a downhill right here. So Melanchthon was the one who carried that Bible-believing line uh, from Luther, but then it just goes downhill. Melanchthon worked with Luther. The connection between Luther and Calvin is doubtful, at least in a personal and practical sense. And it is this personal vital contact that must be traced in discussing the history of New Testament Christianity. Luther read, say, probably only two books by Calvin in his lifetime, but he enjoyed reading them very much according to his reply in a letter to a friend. These two documents were Calvin's reply to Sadoleto and Calvin's treatise on the Lord's Supper. Although Melanchthon's Loci Theolo uh, Theologici preceded Calvin's institute, Calvin is called the leader and standard bearer of theology for the Reformation. Luther's theology, from a scholastic point of view, was unsystemized like Paul's. If we are to go by the judgment of the average historian, Martin Luther said that he was drawn to Melanchthon as a fellow reformer because he knew that he himself was incapable of systematizing anything. Okay, the, the bottom line is, remember I told you Luther is like a gray area, but I put him in a Bible-believing line. 
because Dr. Upman puts them that way. Even though there are some forms of Calvinism that Luther sympathizes with, we got to remember this. One, as I've told you so many times, Bible believers throughout our past history, they didn't get all their doctrine straight because they didn't have all the words of God available in their hands. You try doing that. You can't get right doctrine unless you get the right words of God in your hand to study and read and take time. I mean, these people memorize more verses than you Bible believers who get all your doctrines straight. So we have to be gracious and understanding on that. That's one. Number two, Luther, as Dr. Upman argued, there are some situations here that he's not close with Calvin. So he's not very close with Calvin. And thirdly, his life uh, practice is very different from Calvin's life practice. Calvin and Melanchthon are smooth, scholastic, systemized, systematic theology, exegesis, exegesis all over till it makes you puke because you ate too many McDonald's, MacArthur, so that's what happened. <laughs> so you got to realize here that Martin Luther is very different. He's thinking from an even, uh, he's thinking from a practical standpoint from a preaching standpoint. And that's a Bible believer's mentality and personality. It's a preacher standpoint, a practical standpoint. And we don't care about kicking tails. Melanchthon cared about kicking tails. And then so he tried to work out a compromise in between. Philip Melanchthon gained the literary circles for the cause of the Reformation. But in so doing, his character revealed the handwriting on the wall. For the evangelism and teaching of Martin, culture had reared its ugly head. It has been noted that Melanchthon quietly and naturally attained his theological position without violent changes and struggles like those of Luther. It is interesting to note that the first systematic work Melanchthon produced was written in the interest of practical Christianity and not scientific theology. Evangelism always precedes culture. The theological scrambles which took place after the Augsburg Confession at 1530 were Melanchthon's bread and butter, but they were the farthest thing imaginable from the spirit in which L Luther set about to accomplish his mission. He himself said plainly, this is what Luther said, believe it or not, it sounds like Ruckman almost, leave my name alone and do not call yourselves Lutherans, but Christians. Wow. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Ruckman said the same thing too. But they call them Ruckmanites. It's like they, those Calvinists brag about calling themselves Calvinists or Lutheran. Isn't that funny? Weird, yeah. Spirit of hypocrisy. Spirit of hypocrisy about these people who don't study history, who don't learn from history. The efforts of Melanchthon as a mediator between agnostics and supporters of Luther during his lifetime shows not only a commendable spirit of Christian charity like Billy Graham, Akinga, but a compromising spirit of Christian carnality. Melanchthon stood somewhere between Erasmus and Eusebius. Remember Eusebius? That guy that, was, that kissed Constantine's foot all the time and then you know, acted like a Christian too. One quote says this, he could not stand a split and was always trying to heal the breach. End of quote. When Emil Bruner wrote his preface to the Christian Doctrine of God, Volume 1, he traces his own type of theology back to Peter Lombard, to Calvin, and then to the Loci Theologici of Melanchthon. This is an accurate Classification in some respects, although it magnifies the sterility of Calvin's impact as compared to Lu with Luther's. And this is not entirely true as uh, will be observed. The seeds of the destruction of the revival that occurred in Germany in Luther's days are to be found in the same place they were found in apostolic days, in a representative body of cultured dignitaries who became involved in theological controversy instead of preaching the Bible. Culture follows evangelism and teaching every time. Watch out for that. 
Just watch out for that. Don't fall into that trap. Okay. So this is uh, Philip Melanchthon. Now, the next person we're going to cover who kept this uh, blue line going, Melanchthon brought the Bible believers downhill who carried on this blue line, notice Bullinger. So Bullinger, he is not what some people might confuse as the hyper-dispensationalist guy. Uh, that's a totally other different Bullinger. This guy's name is Johann Heinrich Bullinger. Page 545 of uh, Dr. Ruckman's text. He was born 1504, died in 1575. Bullinger is the most satisfactory of the reformers. Let's see here. As far as his Christian attitude was concerned, not as uh, volatile as Luther, less vindic uh, vindic uh, vindicative than Zwingli, and more scriptural than Calvin, Bullinger was the son of a highly respected married Catholic priest in Switzerland. When Zwingli was killed in battle, Bullinger became pastor of the great Minster Church in Zurich. Zurich. In 1536, he helped draw up the Helvetic Confession. In 1549, uh, he helped compose the Consensus of Zurich, which ended dogmatic disputes among Protestants in Switzerland. Bullinger was a staunch reformer, taking sides with Calvin and Zwingli against the Catholics and the Anabaptists. Oh, who are the Anabaptists? That's uh, us, where we come from. But I'll explain that later. But unlike Calvin and Zwingli, he showed more toleration. Though disagreeing with both groups, Bullinger, as all Baptists, was not in favor of imprisoning or killing anyone for their religious convictions. So basically, this guy, he's a better Calvinist. Basically, he's a John Piper type of guy, okay? So he is not the type of guy who would kill people. So Bullinger, you would say he is like the current Calvinist today. Oh, I wouldn't burn people at the stake. But they would still praise John Calvin. Yeah, weird. Yeah, that's very weird, isn't it? Now, you might say, did John Calvin burn someone at the stake? Yes, I read some of the ridiculous rules that I've given to you about... Um, uh, that Calvin did against uh, to create a church state. It was so hilarious. Like you might recall, he jailed a person a couple of days because the way that they did the hairstyle was just not right. <laughs> and it was just so messed up and it was just so weird. Now, some people will say, and uh, Calvinists would always love to argue that uh, Servetus, when he was burnt alive, under Calvin, that Calvin had no part in it. Now, Michael, a guy named Michael Servetus, he detested, uh, this is a book from Andrew Sluter. It's called Calvinism in the Crosshairs. And I'm reading a Kindle format, so this ain't going to do much help. But this is basically found on uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1. He gives a history of Calvinism here. But he gives a quote about, uh, let me just read some things here that he wrote. This fact is no better seen than the story of Michael Servetus. Servetus was a man with some strange beliefs, no doubt. He believed in uh, baptismal regeneration, although he detested infant baptism, had a skewed view on the Trinity, and thought revelation was completely historical with no future fulfillment. But it was his view on the Trinity that got him in hot water with Calvin. Servetus had correspondence with Calvin through the years and even read his institute. Servetus' views on the Trinity had been condemned by the Roman Catholic Church as heresy. He was arrested and condemned by the Roman Catholic whore, but managed to escape their custody. So instead, they burnt an effigy on him. That'll teach him, he wrote in parentheses. Just a few months later, he shows up in Geneva. Why? Because it's freedom. These guys are loving people. John MacArthur fought for my rights, and then now we can have freedom here in California, religious freedom. <laughs> so in, uh, where the Pope of Protestants had him arrested and tried. So remember, that's John Calvin. He was known as the Pope of Protestants, for some of you who didn't know that sometimes. On October 27, 1553, Servetus was burnt alive at the stake for his heresy, by the Protestant church state of Geneva. Some modern-day Calvinists will try and say that Calvin had nothing to do with the trial and execution. But Calvin's own words beg to differ. This is what he said in a letter. Quote, 
I am unwilling to pledge my word for his safety. For if he shall come, Servetus, I shall never permit him to depart alive, provided my authority be of any avail. Wow. Now, blah, blah, the Calvinists, I'm sick and tired of Paul Washer, John MacArthur, Piper should pipe down a bit, and then James White. They, blah, 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 blah. No, they didn't read Calvin's letters. They didn't read that. They're just lying. I thought their lordship salvation, that fruit should come out of them. They got nasty fruits, man. Lying. I doubt their salvation now, you know? Okay, anyways. Now, the reason why I'm hard on Calvin is some people might get upset with me, but the reason why is you don't know the conflict that I've been through. You don't know. It's like if someone told you about the fight that was going on... Uh, that they had with someone going on in their family, it's not your place to judge what's, going, what's right and what's wrong if you had no business and you have no idea what's going on. All right, and so then why don't you study up a bit, but you don't study. Instead, you just hear, and then you just like to hear whatever you want to hear and think that we're all the same bunch. No, we're not the same bunch. Now, this is what's been going on. And to carry on this line here, it's a straight line, so I won't say that he is a Bible believer, but this guy can carry something where the Bible-believing line can have ammunition. His name is Jacob Arminius. Now, who is this guy? This guy was the enemy of Calvin himself. So Calvinists will say, are you an Armenian or uh, do, you, do you believe in Armenianism or Calvinism? Now, there's no such thing. OK, there's no such thing. However, Jacob Arminius, he did play a pivotal role where Calvinists know that this is the guy that attacks their system. He is born in 1560 to 1609. He was the thorn in uh, Dr. Upman's church history book, page 547. The thorn in Calvin's flesh and in the flesh of his followers. Born in Udwater, Holland, he received his education at Utrecht and Marburg. He studied in Geneva and ba Basel under Theodore Beza. Okay, so this ain't a dummy. This is a guy who had similar backgrounds like uh, Calvin. He became professor of theology at the University of Leiden in 1603. Before his death in 1609, Arminius held a synod of Reformed theologians for the purpose of clarifying some of Calvin's more scrambled type of anti-scriptural guesswork. After his death, Arminius' followers presented a five-point answer to Calvin's five-point tulip system. Often slandered by hyper-Calvinists, Arminius actually taught the system used by Billy Sunday, Dwight Moody, uh, George Whitfield, George W. Truitt, Dr. Delhan, Charles Fuller, Jack Van Impe, Jack Hiles, Lee Robertson, John R. Rice, and Billy Graham. The only place where Arminius differed with the fundamental soul winners of the 19th and 20th centuries was that he taught that although God would give the saints grace so that they need not fall, still he thought that some scripture seemed to teach that it was possible for a man to fall away from salvation. This was John Wesley's position and the position of Sam Jones. So we see right here that Bible believers are very much like Jacob Arminius, but that one thing we differ is, no, we believe that once saved, always saved. We don't believe you can fall away. This consigned Arminius to the rack immediately. Now, remember the torture device, the rack, that I've explained in Intermediate Discipleship from the Inquisition. So they tied him on the rack. Although, strangely enough, his Calvinistic opponents, who were supposed to believe in eternal security and election so strongly in the same breath, believed in baptismal regeneration by sprinkling babies. There are heretics, and then there are heretics. In view of the fact that the Episcopalians, Methodists, Lutherans, Catholics, and Pentecostal groups all taught that a Christian could lose salvation, only a fool would think that they had not found something in the scripture to lead them to believe that. And then he gives up the wrong passages that people use and abuse who are not dispensational that talk about losing salvation. Let's see right here. 
Arminius, uh, I'm reading on page 548, here's a famous saying. Uh, Dr. Ruckman, when he was going through his master's degree in front of the examining board, they asked him if he was a Calvinist or Armenian. I told them that I was an Armenian till I got to Calvary, and after that I was a Calvinist. I was told that is not a very good answer. I replied, it wasn't a very good question. <laughs> Arminius believed that man was totally depraved, but his will was not depraved. Yeah, that's what we uh, agree in. He taught that Christ died for all sinners. Yes, we agree with that. And those who rejected his atonement, he died for them. Yes. Amen. He also believed that election was conditioned on foreknowledge. Yes, because that is exactly what the scripture stated. Yes, Amen. he taught that any sinner could resist the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, exactly as the scripture stated the matter. Yes, we agree. Let's see right here. So notice right here that a lot of things that Arminius taught uh, we can agree with. This is interesting. Dr. Upman argues, uh, in 1618, a synod was held at Dort for the purpose of putting 13 Arminians on trial by 117 Calvinists. Wow. Cowards, man. The Arminians were found guilty and deprived of their clerical positions. The Lord retaliated with the greatest revival England ever saw under the ministry of an Armenian, John Wesley. While the Presbyterian and Reformed churches in England and Holland went down the tube, Sam Jones, Bob Jones Sr., Bob Schuler, and Peter Cartwright were Armenians. Two of the greatest apostates in the 20th century were Calvinists, Philip Schaff and Louise Berkhoff. All right, so by their fruits he shall know them. By their fruits he shall know them. Okay, let's see right here. We see Jacob Arminius. What is Mother Whore doing in the meantime, right? Because of Luther's Reformation, and remember I told you the Bible believers are coming out more freely, and the Roman Empire is crumbling. This is a very big death threat to hell. So hell did two ingenious things. One was mingle up with the Bible believers, so then Calvinists came in. The second thing, this is the one thing you want to know because th these, this is probably the most powerful group that ever lived today if you go on top of the pyramid. The Jesuits. Ignatius de Loyola. He is the guy that started this evil branch. And trust me, when you study their history, these guys are probably the most deadly, the most evil religious people that ever lived. Even Ellen G. White had something negative to say about this evil group, okay? The Reformation was their open door for the Bible believers. The Catholics wanted to counter it. So they called it the Counter-Reformation. Loyola came from the same school as John Calvin. Birds of a feather flock together, <laughs> believe it or not. Okay, now I'm going to read from Frederick Widdowson's book, A Bible Believer Looks at World History, page 282. The Roman Catholic Church did not take long to react to the Reformation that was sweeping Northern Europe with a counter-Reformation. One of the important figures in this effort was a Basque named Inigo de Loyola, whose name has come down to us as Ignatius Loyola. There are several universities named after him. And he is the founder of the so-called Society of Jesus, which we know as the Jesuits. Here we go. Uh, so he's taking Malachi Martin's work, The Jesuits, Edmond Paris's The Secret History of the Jesuits, and Durant's work. So if you take those three works on Jesuits, then you can learn a lot. Here we go. Born in 1491, just as a new era was approaching that would overturn the dominant old ways of thinking in Europe and the Reformation's beginning. Injured in battle, he became the founder of a movement that would be fiercely loyal to the Pope and... Uh, I always like this, man. Okay, here we go. Continuing on. Uh, 
Injured in battle, he became the founder of a movement that would be fiercely loyal to the Pope and to combating the effects of the Reformation. He developed a series of spiritual exercises designed to strengthen his disciples in their purpose. If you look at David W. Daniel's book, uh, he argues that Ignatius Loyola designed a book that controlled the very air that they breathed, pretty much. Uh, that's his book, Did the Catholic Church Give Us the Bible, by David W. Daniels. Let's see, his disciples became so influential in the Roman Catholic countries that their influence as the confessors of kings and queens far outshone their numbers and created havoc among the heads of state. They also became influential in all aspects of scientific study and missionary work for the Catholic Church. You know our governor in Newsom right here? He graduated from a Jesuit university, Santa Clara right here. So you got to realize they are at the pinnacle of education. Pinnacle of education. Georgetown, for example, Fauci, he uh, did a speech over there, coincidentally, on some stuff about beep, 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 that all of a sudden, the year after that, beep, beep, beep came out all over the world. Uh -huh. Strange, right? Strange. All birds of a feather flock together. There's something evil within everything. Anyways... Let's see here. Their efforts at sabotaging the Reformation and their espionage in the Protestant countries became so much a factor that there is, according to the Oxford English Dictionary itself, a word to describe deception, lying, and intrigue called Jesuitry. Wow. Don't you know that? That speaks volumes. The power of the Jesuit order was so feared that one of our founding fathers and first presidents reportedly had this to say about them. Quote, I do not like the reappearance of the Jesuits. Shall we not have regular swarms of them here in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as printers, publishers, <coughs> writers, and schoolmasters? If ever there was a body of men who merited damnation on earth, and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. Nevertheless, we are compelled by our system of religious toleration to offer them an asylum. That's John Adams, his letter to Thomas Jefferson, May the 5th, 1816. Here's another one. This is an American Presbyterian pastor in the work Papism in the 19th Century, 1841 by Robert J. Beckenridge. Quote, the Jesuits direct all the affairs and shape all the principles of the papal church in the United States. These are startling facts. Though we have, no, though we have long known them, we are shocked at the contemplation of those approaching evils, which this new proof brings so clearly before our minds. Yes, we repeat it. The nation cannot avoid the most dreadful calamities from this fatal and corrupt society unless prompt and vigorous measures can be taken to deliver it from the impending curse. The society of Jesus, Jesuits, is the enemy of man. The whole human race should unite for its overthrow. Earth and heaven should rejoice together over its tomb. For there is no alternative between its total extirpation and the absolute corruption and degradation of mankind. Ellen G. White, from her book, Great Controversy, she said this on pages 234 to 236. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. To them greater power, a bull was issued, reestablishing the Inquisition, and atrocities too terrible to bear the light of day were repeated in its secret dungeons. Such were the means which Rome had invoked to quench the light of the Reformation, to withdraw men from the uh, from uh, to withdraw from men the Bible, and to restore the ignorance and superstition of the Dark Ages. Let's see right here. One of the practices of the Jesuits, uh, Widowson continues on page 283, one of their practices was to infiltrate Protestant universities and schools, posing as Protestants all the while subtly changing the teachings to be more favorable to the Catholic Church, and to the Pope in particular, in calling into question core Protestant beliefs. As I have stated before, the idea of a Protestant theologian graduating from a Jesuit university should give one pause 
at the very least, and anything he says against the Bible should be looked at very skeptically. The Roman Catholic Church was so horrified at the success of the Reformation that a special council was called to answer its alleged heresies, and the Council of Trent is still claimed to be a valid of the Roman Church's position today. As a matter of fact, Mel Gibson, producer of The Passion of the Christ, has said that he accepts the Council of Trent as an authoritative statement of Catholic doctrine. Okay. So Mel Gibson would approve of the Council of Trent. And a lot of Christians says, uh, a lot of Christians say, it was such a Christian movie. It was such a Christian movie. Now, credit to whom credit is due, okay? I believe that the movie has done some good for the Christian, but, you know, there are Catholic politicians who have done some good for the Christian churches today, too. It wasn't MacArthur. He wasn't the first one. You know who was the first one? Catholics! and Jews in New York. They were the ones that opened that door for that religious freedom for the churches during beep, beep, beep scenario. That's why MacArthur was able to successfully follow up. For some of you who didn't know. For some of you who didn't know. How about that? All right, anyways. What, did, what, is, the, uh, what is the Council of Trent? It was conducted by four different popes. Paul III, Julius III, Paul IV, and Pius IV between the years 1545 to 1565 and had the twofold goal of bringing reform to Catholicism. Oh, their reformation, see? And condemning and hindering the growth of Protestantism. A series of anathemas were issued against Protestant doctrine. The index of prohibited books were set up condemning authors and writings which were deemed anti-Catholic. During the era of Trent, the barbarous Inquisition was further unleashed against those who dared to reject Roman heresies. In 1564, the doctrines of Trent were summarized in a papal bull entitled the Tridentine Profession of Faith. Dr. Raymond Serberg notes that, quote, all Roman Catholic clergy and teachers must subscribe to it as well as converts to the faith from Protestantism. The person subscribing to it must swear true obedience to the Pope. End of quote. That's from the Christian News, July 10th, 1995, page 6. Let's see right here. They hurled 125 anathemas against Bible-believing Christians. Here's Canon 1. If anyone shall deny that the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore entire Christ are truly, really, and substantially contained in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist and shall say that he is only in it as a sign or in a figure or virtually, let him be accursed. Do you believe in that, that it's a figure and a sign and not literally the body and blood of Jesus? Yeah, amen, we do, right? Okay, you're going to hell, that means. Here's another one. If anyone shall say that the substance of the bread and wine remains in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist together with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and shall deny that wonderful and singular conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood, the outward forms of the bread and wine still remaining, which conversion the Catholic Church most aptly calls transubstantiation, let him be accursed. Do you believe in that as well? Yes, we do. Well, guess what? You're going to hell then, okay? If any man should, this is canon 2, now this is canon 6. If any man shall say that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored in the holy sacrament of the Eucharist, even with the open worship of Yatria, and therefore not to be venerated with any peculiar festal celebrity, nor to be solemnly carried about in procession. See, they're worshiping a cookie. They're worshiping a piece of cookie. Yeah, amen. Amen. Oh, we're not? Yeah, you are. Bunch of dumb Catholics who live in America, who don't come from the Vatican itself, and who don't know their history. Let's see right here. Let's keep reading right here. Uh, Nor to be solemnly carried about in processions according to the praiseworthy and universal rites and customs of the Holy Church, and that he is not to be publicly set before the people to be adored, and that his adorers are idolaters, let him be accursed. Are they idolaters? Do you believe in that? Yeah, amen. Then you're accursed. You're going to hell. That was canon six. 
Canon 9, if anyone shall say that the ungodly man is justified by faith only. Do you believe in that? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 don't be quick. You don't want to burn in hell. <laughs> if anyone shall say that the ungodly man is justified by faith only, so as to understand that nothing else is required that may cooperate to obtain the grace of justification and that it is in no wise necessary for him to be prepared and disposed by the motion of his own will, let him be accursed. Canon 9. Now here's Canon 12. If anyone shall say that justifying faith is nothing else then confidence in the divine mercy, pardoning sins for Christ's sake. Yeah, glory to God. Amen. Or that, is, or that it is that confidence alone by which we are justified. Hallelujah. Let it be a curse. Canon 12. Wicked, evil. Wicked and evil. He gives a lot more quotes about the Council of Trent quotes on 285. And uh, 286, which we don't have time to go over, but there's a lot. We will come back to the Jesuits, but they are going to be a dangerous group. And Ignatius Loyola really did that. Uh, David W. Daniels, if I recall from his research, he mentioned that Ignatius Loyola, he went through five different tortures uh, to prove his loyalty to the Pope. Wow. So these guys are demon-possessed. You ever wonder where secret agents get their... Yeah tactics and ideas from yeah. they didn't just learn it out of thin air guys and especially when you got the founder of uh, the letters C and the letters I and A as an apple the founder of that organization who has connection with Knights of Malta which is second most powerful Catholic order next to Jesuits you think and pray about that for a while but God has his men. Yeah. In spite of the, the devil using he, his two wicked streams, God had his people going on. Melanchthon brought it downhill. Jacob Arminius is that straight line where he can be able to retaliate against Calvinism. And then here are the other people. John Knox from 1513 from 1572, page 531 of Dr. Upman's book. Similar to like Luther, basically uh, a reformed preacher. John Knox of Scotland was raised under the preaching of a Bible-believing Protestant, George Wishart, who was burned at the stake in 1546. Later, Knox was arrested and served as a galley slave for 19 months. The worst part of being a slave, the worst job ever if you're going to be a slave, is to work in the galleys. That was the worst part. That was the worst job as a slave ever. But guess what? He returned to England and for five years preached the doctrines of the German Reformation. When Bloody Mary got on the throne, Knox escaped and went to Frankfurt, Germany, later going on to Geneva and talking with Calvin. He preached in France and Germany. Knox returned to Scotland in 1559 and boldly declared before his Catholic queen, Mary of Lorraine, that the Catholic mass was a mess and the Roman Catholic Church was a whore. Miraculously escaping death a second time, he lived to see Mary Stuart at 1560 come on the throne. She had Knox arrested for treason. Why? For not believing in a cannibal sacrifice Sunday morning for the dead, Dr. Uckman writes. <laughs> a court acquitted Knox and he continued to preach the Bible till he died of old age in 1572. The strong Protestant flavor of Scotch Christianity, especially in Northern Ireland, is largely due to the work and ministry of John Knox. Two things I want to say about John Knox is this, and you can uh, confirm by researching yourself. John Knox's prayers were the one that brought terror to everybody. As a matter of fact, his prayers were so scary that he had a burden for Scotland that he prayed so powerfully to God, God, give me Scotland, give me Scotland, give me Scotland, or else I die. It scared Mary, Queen of Scots, so much that she said, I fear John Knox's prayers more than all the assembled armies of Europe. That's mighty. That's mighty. They stood their ground. All right, another person that uh, the Lord used was William Tyndale. William Tyndale. William Tyndale, he is the guy that opened the doors 
for the English King James Bible to be set in. William Tyndale, he did have some encounters with Luther. Uh, I would recommend going through uh, bios of William Tyndale and also the movie God's Outlaw. Those are, the, those are where I'm getting all my information from. But William Tyndale was during a time, uh, probably the worst king of England, that's King Henry VIII. Now you might recall that England in its empire was growing powerfully at that time. It was growing powerfully, and then I've told you about William Wallace, that they had to fight for their rights. After they fought for their rights, Scot the Scottish people, they were able to live in their freedom. But England was very powerful, and it kept growing in power. King Henry VIII, his timeline was very, very important, and I'll explain it in our next discipleship class. But uh, King Henry VIII, he was the one that broke off from the Roman Catholic Empire and started where the Anglican Church were able to put a foothold. He was probably the worst king of England, and William Tyndale was contemporary that time. Now, King Henry VIII, he still had a lot of Catholic leanings. He just wants to start his own church. The difference between an Anglican or Church of England with the Roman Catholic Church is just the names and labels, pr pretty much. King Henry VIII, he tried to catch William Tyndale. Tyndale was always on hiding, translating the scriptures. Wycliffe, remember, translated the Bible into English. But if you look at the English language, it always keeps changing. So it was very old English. So Tyndale had to write the English of his timeline. Eventually, there was a spy who pretended to be Tyndale's friend, and then he betrayed Tyndale, turned him over to the authorities, and Tyndale was condemned to be burnt at the stake. William Tyndale, he fought with uh, one of the, the quote-unquote Catholic or Anglican scholars, whatever you want to call it, one of the priests, mm -hmm. and then he basically said that when he gets his English Bible done, I will make sure that the plowboy knows more of the scripture than you do. Yeah. That priest flipped his lid. He got so angry. Yeah. Tyndale was a genius. He knew multiple languages, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, etc. A genius, but then always worked hard. He was betrayed, and then he was tied up to be burnt at the stake. He gave one prayer to God that just turned the miracle. He said, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And then he died being burnt at the stake. When he gave that prayer, you know what King Henry VIII did? He had them check up Tyndale's uh, writings, his translation. They couldn't find errors. So then King Henry VIII said, if there be no heresies in this, then let this be spread abroad through all the people. So all the people in England had access to the English Bible. And that's a very important time period. That's how God mightily used William Tyndale. That the Catholic Empire, remember the Holy Roman Empire, they're not able to touch England because of King Henry VIII breaking off. So Tyndale started something big. And we're going to come into that in our next discipleship class. There are two concentrations you want to look at. That's Europe and England. You notice God is folding the door in Europe and he's turning to England. That's what's going on. So then the Baptists were the ones that really came out from England. But Europe had its last chance, the Anabaptists. Yeah. Before we come to those Baptists in England, let's talk about the Anabaptists here. The Anabaptists were the last chance pretty much for Europe. They're the ones that kept the Bible-believing movement going. So many different names from the Anabaptists. This is the peak of the Bible-believing movement is the Anabaptists right here. The Anabaptists, you, we give a lot of different names right here. The best book to read on the martyrs of the Anabaptists is Martyr's Mirror. Not Fox's Book of Martyr, it's Martyr's Mirror. If you read Martyr's Mirror, it gives a record of all the Anabaptist names. So we've seen the heroes, John Knox, William Tyndale, and then Men of Simons, Balsasar, Hubmeyer, Felix Mainz, George Laroque, and Michael Sattler, and so much more. Okay, I'm going to read it purely from Dr. Upman's Church History book, page 500. Out of the Reformation, remember that opened the door to everything, the Reformation. Out of the Reformation came the Mennonites, Dunkers, Moravians, and Amish. Menno Simons, 1496 to 1516, gave up his priesthood in the Catholic Church in 1536 and took on the views of, notice these names that we kind of remember back in our church history. Paulicians, 
Donatists, Montanists, Albigenses, Paterines, and Waldensians. He insisted on, upon the absolute authority of the Bible as the final infallible rule for faith and practice and taught that the pure church was to be an association of regenerated believers, not a state church full of sanctified devils. That's huge. That's different from Calvin. Mano Simons was born in Friesland in 1492. Upon beholding the sickening spectacle of a common tailor beheaded with the sword because he had rebaptized an adult Catholic, Mano decided to start searching the scripture. He became intrigued with the idea of more than one baptism, and he thought surely he could find some trace of rebaptizing in the Bible. He found it, Acts 19, 1 through 5, but was horrified to learn that there wasn't one case where any infant was baptized. Whereupon he read Luther's works and then went and talked to Bullinger and Booser upon the matter. He found out that they could no more justify infant baptism than praying to dead saints. Until his own death, 1559, Menno became an apostle of Baptist truth and went all over Europe setting up independent local Baptist churches in Westphalia, Friesland, Holland, Brabant, and the German provinces on the Baltic. Menno's followers in Lithuania emigrated to Russia and founded scores of churches in the Crimea. Charles V said that all of Menno's followers should be burned at the stake. The governor of Friesland said anyone giving him food, shelter, or assistance would be killed as a heretic. Fourteen of his followers were burned in 1534 at England and four more in 1538. Menno published several works, Renunciation of Rome, Testimony Against John von Leyden, and the Foundation Book. Balthazar Hummeyer, 1480-1528, left the priesthood and came boldly out into the position of a Bible-believing Baptist. He was burned at the stake, and the papist in Vienna drowned his wife in the Danube River. When the Bible-believing Protestants in the Netherlands tore down the images in Catholic churches at 1566, Philip of Spain sent 10,000 Spanish Catholics up into Holland under the Duke of Alva and killed over 9,000 Bible-believing people between 1567 and 1573. The murderous Duke of Alva, who ranks with such butchers in history as Lenin, Bonner, Tilly, Stalin, Bloody Mary, Hitler, and Torquemada, inspired William of Orange to raise up a revolt, 1568, which at first was unsuccessful, but later ran the Spaniards out of the country. The Duke of Alva slaughtered another 7,000 Bible believers in 1576 in Antwerp, and by this act so infuriated the entire nation that Holland and Belgium united with France and Germany in their efforts to drive the Spanish out. Let's see right here. The greatest recipients of these religious debaucheries were the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists had come from a long line of believers who never at any time practiced infant baptism nor at any time approved of a state church. Further, there is no evidence that they at any time were deceived by the traditions of the fathers. This made them a target not only of the psychotic papists, but also the target of Calvinists, Zwinglians, and Lutherans, just like today. The Bible believers are the targets of the state, church, and Calvinists. Oh, whoop de doo you don't, you don't know that? Well, just look me up. You see how many Calvinists get angry at me. <laughs> While the Catholics continue to slaughter Protestants, sometimes at the rate of 5,000 a week, the fanatical followers of the Reformers, who st still had papal blood in their veins, went at the Anabaptists with a fury. Fel Felix Mainz, 1498 to 1527, fell out with Zwingli, and the town fathers in Zurich. They set his execution day for January the 5th, 1527. They bound him hand and foot, took him out into Lake Zurich in a boat, and threw him overboard. On the way out, Felix preached to the people on the shore. A reformed pastor in the boat tried to silence him, but he went on anyway. Woo. 
they put a black cap over his head before dumping him out of the boat. George Blorock died 1529, was another Swiss Baptist. He put Zwingli to shame when the two debated over the subject of water baptism. George told Zwingli that he had the same right to separate from him as Zwingli had to separate from the Pope. Blorock was put into chains and led through the streets of Zurich, being, being beaten by the town councilmen till the blood flowed in his tracks. He was then sent back to prison, but later released. He was exiled from Zurich and then pursued from place to place by papists and reformers until Catholics burned him at the stake in Innsbruck, 1529. Ludwig Herzer was decapitated, 5, February 1529, at Constance for teaching that water was not connected with salvation in any form. Amen. In Basel, Switzerland, five Baptists were drowned. When Gastius reported on the torturing of a Baptist by the followers of Zwingli and Calvin, he said the man cried, Why do you not kill me? I will not betray my brethren even if you tear me to pieces. My body is yours. Burn it, scathe it, lacerate it, destroy it if you please. Increase your cruelty, you will gain nothing. He then spat in the face of the Christians who were torturing him. <laughs> this particular man's sin was that he had been immersed in water following his conversion to Christ. Such an act was an open admission that covenant theology was powerless and that the infant baptism, which supposedly was a seal of the covenant, did nothing but dampen a baby, Dr. Upman says. Let's see right here. When Hubmeyer left Zurich, 1526, he had gone to Moravia. The local churches there began to multiply rapidly. Some of the congregations moved to Austerlitz. All of these Baptist groups were welcomed by their heretical brethren, the Hussites, you know, John Huss's followers. There were 60 congregations of these Baptists by 1576, and many of them settled in Hungary and Transylvania. Hubmeyer's death at the stake did nothing to shake the Baptist congregations. They knew when it came to biblical arguments that Hubmeyer had Zwingli beaten a rock in a hard place all of his life. In their debates, Zwingli had appealed to 1 Corinthians 7, 14 as a proof that children of saved parents had to be saved. Hubmeyer quoted John 3, 3. When Zwingli replied that surely John the Baptist must have baptized a few infants, that's what R.C. Sproul did during his debate. And that there must have been some children in the household of Stephanus. 1 Corinthians 1, 16. Hummeyer quoted 1 Corinthians 1, 14 to 15 to him and called to his attention that Paul wasn't worried about baptizing anyone, yeah. let alone infants. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Quote, Hummeyer said, you may as well be still, he said to Zwingli. <laughs> When Zing, Zwingli persisted in going on with the old Campbellite argument, Hummeyer reminded him that he had really better shut up because that is exactly what the Catholic priest had said to Zwingli when those two were in a scriptural debate. <laughs> Bishop Fabry published six sermons against the Baptists in Prague, 1528. Dr. Leopold Dick published a tractate against them in 1531. Bullinger wrote extensively against them. Prince William V offered a reward for every Baptist captured. Consequently, many of the Baptists were hanged and some of them had their tongues cut out. Soon the prisons in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland were crowded with Baptists. They were branded, drowned, and, or burned at the stake by Christians. Like today, Calvinists and Catholics are the ones who have all the news media publication and the internet and the subscribers that blinds all you poor fools out there. While the Baptists were the one hanged, persecuted, and preaching the gospel. While they're all right. study, study, they ain't preaching the word of God. A certain George Wagner was captured in Munich, thrown in jail, and subsequently burned at the stake. Seventeen Baptists were burned alive at the stake in Regensburg, while those who recanted had the privilege of being beheaded before they were burned. In Rothenburg on the Neckar, 1527, Michael Sattler, last guy. There's a movie called The Radicals. It's a good movie about him. A converted monk 
was brought out in public and had his tongue cut out, his flesh torn with hot pincers, and then he was burned to ashes while the local Catholic constabulary drowned his wife and several of his friends. Sixty-five Baptists were killed in Kitzbühel, 60, 66 at Rattenburg, and 22 at Kufstein. So this is all your Baptist heritage. This is all your Baptist heritage right here of the Anabaptists. They were killed, marred, murdered by Catholics and by Calvinists. Yes, by Calvinists too. But uh, they stood their ground. You can confirm this in research, but Anabaptists knew so much of that scripture that, uh, that it was said that the people dreaded to debate an Anabaptist. Women and the men knew the scripture so much that the priests couldn't debate with them. Anabaptists, they were truly Bible believers. Amen. They weren't reformed, systematic, theology, exegesis. They weren't that. They knew their book. They knew their book. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And I pray that what we've learned from our history will take with us and then be able to apply and practice and continue on the history of Bible believers, not go downhill with culture and semantics and systematic and all this kind of theological bunk, but rather your word, preach your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.